Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm David Knight. It's Thursday, May 7th, 2015. Today, a federal appeals court, unanimously with the three judges there, said that the NSA's collection of phone data is illegal. The headline says that it's excessive, but they actually said it's illegal. Nevertheless, they refuse to expel the elephant from the room. They're going back and appealing to Congress to write some clearer laws. I think the Fourth Amendment has been very clear all along, and so has the FISA uh, Act, the uh, Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. They say the bulk collection of Americans' phone records by the government exceeds what Congress has allowed, and the court is asking Congress to step in, decide how to best balance national security and privacy interests. There is no balance to be made. There is no trade-off to be made. We will only have national security when we first protect individual privacy, individual liberty. If we trample on that, none of us are secure. We are living in a fantasy if we think that. We have given up our freedoms and our security and our privacy to live in a prison security state. They also asked the uh, Congress to better define, as they say, where these boundaries exist. But if you look at the New York Times, they point out that uh, they found that this is illegal. And as I said before, if it's illegal, why won't they do a stay? See, they're, they're not even going to stop the process from the national security. They are so afraid of the NSA that they won't say, stop it, until we take this to a higher level. This is going to work its way up the courts, but of course right now they're appealing to Congress and the Patriot Act is coming up for reauthorization. So we see in this article from USA Today, NSA program opponents in Congress urge the Patriot Act to be changed after the Supreme Court ruling. This is a quote from Senator Patrick Leahy, Democrat of Vermont. He says, the dragnet collection of Americans' phone records is unnecessary and ineffective and is now a federal appeal court has found that the program is illegal. How about that? Unnecessary ineffective and illegal. So why don't we stop it? Why don't we enforce the Constitution? And you know what? It isn't like we just figured this out. We were told this by William Binney and the other NSA whistleblowers over a decade ago, after September 11th. They said, this is illegal. It is unconstitutional. It exceeds, uh, it violates the Fourth Amendment. It exceeds the authority under FISA. They went to Congress, they informed Congress, and for all of this time, Congress has done nothing but rubber stamp it. Everyone is afraid of the CIA. Everyone is afraid of the NSA in Washington. Now to go on, he points out, of course, uh, this is on the other side. We have, of course, John McCain, always in favor of the security state. He says, I think we have to have the ability to monitor communications. Everybody's communications is what they want to do, and he says, Congress needs to come up again with some kind of a balance. That's the way they incrementally enact this infrastructure of tyranny. Stay with us because in the last section of the program, Rob Dew is going to come in and we're going to talk about all of this, this infrastructure of tyranny, this legal and technological infrastructure that they've created and how it is tied to Jade Helm 15. Remember the logo? Master the Human Domain. They mean something very specific about that. It is tied into the surveillance state, and we're going to break that down for you at the end of this show. Now, we got one court that said today that this is all illegal. Nevertheless, and of course, that's getting our phone calls and, and that sort of thing they're collecting. But then there's a stingray program that the police are operating, that Homeland Security is operating. That was also said by a court to be illegal. But earlier this week, we had another appeal court overturn that ruling. So now we've got contradictory rulings between these different courts. We have to understand that we don't need a bunch of politically appointed lawyers to read the Constitution for us. It's very plain. We need to take this into our own hands and say, we're not going to allow these congressmen to sit here and do nothing. We're going to throw them out. We're going to violate or, or nullify their laws uh, with jury nullification, with state nullification, with whatever we can do. Now, this is an article from Wired Magazine, and it says, U.S. Circuit Court has handed privacy advocates a surprising reversal on a landmark pro-privacy decision. And this was a man who had been tracked by cops as he went on a three-month robbery spree. Okay, so he's robbing houses for three months before they do anything. That's the first takeaway from this. But, of course, they did all this without a search warrant. They could have gotten a search warrant, but... I guess maybe it's just inconvenient. That's not really the issue. They're not even talking to most courts about this because they've got a non-disclosure agreement that they signed with Harris Corporation that created the technology that they say is more important 
than the legal system, more important than their oath to the Constitution or their job supposedly to uphold the law. It makes it very clear once again, just like we see with the uh, trade agreements that are going on, transatlantic, transpacific, these people work for the corporations. They don't work for the UNI. They don't work for the Constitution. They don't obey their oath. And this came out. This is a panel of 11th Circuit judges. They overturned the ruling from the same circuit court made just last year in U.S. versus Davis. They say the new ruling instead finds that because Davis's phone location data wasn't his property. Here's the third party doctrine again. This is what Rand Paul nailed Jay Johnson, the head of uh, uh, DHS Homeland Security. He asked him specifically about third party data and Jay Johnson pretended that he didn't know what that was. Now, either the guy is incredibly stupid or he's an unbelievable liar, an unmitigated liar. I, I think it's probably the latter. Anyway, they find that this property wasn't his, but it belonged to his phone carrier. See, that is the legal fiction that allows them to do this kind of uh, vacuuming up of your data. It's the same kind of legal fiction that says they can do civil asset forfeiture because your property was an accessory in a crime. So it's not a criminal action. The Constitution doesn't come into play. And uh, they can just take your property because your property is bad, is bad. And it doesn't have any civil liberties because it's an inanimate object. But nevertheless, even though it's an inanimate object, it still created a crime. So now they say, well, this third-party data that's out there, that belongs to your phone carrier. And they can just voluntarily turn it over to us when we ask them because if they don't play ball like that, they won't get these kinds of uh, area monopolies like we give the phone companies. To give you another idea of how bad this is getting, because it's not just looking at our virtual presence, but they're monitoring us physically. And of course, we know they're going to be tracking all the cars. Right now, they, they can't wait just a couple of years until they get uh, mandated boxes and all the cars to track us, of course. They've got cameras everywhere. They've got license plate readers that they're putting everywhere. Look at this story from today on Infowars.com. Town installs license plate scanning cameras in cactuses. I mean, this is like something from the old comedy spy show, Get Smart. They put up these fake cactuses. You can see the picture of that thing there with a camera in it. The one with the camera in it is a fake cactus. I thought at first they had dug a hole in a cactus uh, plant and stuck a camera in there, um, but that's actually a fake one. The town of Paradise Valley in Arizona has installed license plate scanning cameras and fake cactuses with no public consultation whatsoever. Yeah, they don't ever ask us, just like Jade Helm. They could care less once we find out either. It says, just days after the DHS announced it's going to revive a nationwide version of the program. You remember when we reported on that last year? Remember when Drudge picked it up and started talking about it and everybody said, oh, license plate readers. We never were gonna do license plate readers. That, that's not gonna happen, forget it. Then it all dies down and guess what they're doing? Now they're planting fake cactuses with cameras in it so they can read your license plate. The Valley Police said that they were not prepared to make a statement at this time. Again, stonewalling the local news who's asking them about it. They say the network was similarly rebuffed when they attempted to get answers on license plate scanners that were being installed in traffic lights back in February. In other words, it's none of your business and we're not going to tell you. Now, along the lines of whether or not Congress is going to do something, we see uh, on Breitbart that Rand Paul came out and says, uh, we're going to take the NSA all the way to the Supreme Court and win. And I hope he does. And we need to remember and we need to respect the fact that Rand Paul is one of the very few people who has done anything about this. And the real problem, though, is that Congress is doing absolutely nothing about it. They have shirked their responsibility. They're not doing anything. And so one senator goes out and he tries to take it through the courts because he can't get his colleagues to do what they should do. And I'll tell you what they should do. I think that if you've got a criminal organization that is violating their charter, violating the law, violating the Constitution, doing it all in secret, operating as some kind of a black op criminal organization, maybe you stop funding them. Maybe you just cut it out. They don't have the guts to do that, not in Congress. Maybe Rand Paul would, I don't know, but he's going to take it uh, to the uh, Supreme Court, he said, if necessary. Now, going back to the court decisions, because we've got multiple court decisions that come out. One of them says, this is not uh, uh, something that's going to fly. And then the other one says, no, that's fine. You can do dragnet surveillance of people's license plates. You can do stingray and all that sort of thing. And of course, it's going to go back and forth as it goes up through the courts. And eventually, it'll bounce around to the Supreme Court. Do we really want our rights determined by some politically appointed judges, nine individuals that are not elected, not accountable, can never be taken out? I don't think so. 
the real issue is, can we read the Constitution? And there was an interesting article that my wife sent me, uh, which I think they got it completely wrong. They were complaining about Antonin Scalia saying that the Constitution was dead. He went to a, uh, an organization here at SMU in January, and he said, it is dead, dead, dead. Now, you may look at that and say, yeah, they ignore every aspect of it, but that was not what he was talking about. He was saying it was dead, 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 in contrast to the idea that is put out that it is a living document. And when they mean that, what they're doing is they're just deconstructing it so that they say the words mean whatever we say the words are. If you change the meaning of the individual words and you ignore the original, con uh, the original intent, that's the concept known as originalism, if you take it out of the context of the deliberations of the Constitution, if you take it out of the context of the original meaning of the language, then you can twist it and, me and mesh it around to mean anything that you wish. That's why we continue to see the courts making different decisions, along with the fact that they are politically interested, politically controlled. Now, what was interesting about this article, and it was uh, on addictinginfo.org to me, was they said, oh, the founders thought it was a living document. And first they quote Thomas Jefferson, who says that, in, in response, he says, well, we might as well require man to wear still the same coat which fitted him when as a boy, as civilized society, to remain ever under the regimen of their barbarous ancestors. In other words, what he's saying is, there ought to be a means to change the, the Constitution. And of course, they provided a legitimate means to change the Constitution, other than just ignoring what it says or reinterpreting the language. And then they go on to quote Madison, and this is what is interesting, because they took it out of context completely, and they twisted his words in it to mean exactly the same thing, illustrating how they do this to the Constitution itself. This is the quote from Madison. He says, I entirely concur in the propriety of resorting to the sense in which the Constitution was accepted and ratified, and that sense alone is it a legitimate Constitution. If that's not the guide in expounding it, there may be no security for a consistent and stable more than for a faithful exercise of its power. Now, as I read this, the language sounds very stilted to you, doesn't it? Yea, verily. Isn't this true, right? It's not the way we talk today. Words change. Grammar changes. Nevertheless, you can look at this and you can understand what it is saying. And I'll go on and finish the quote. He says, if the meaning of the text be sought in the changeable meaning of the words composing it. In other words, words are going to change in meaning over time. It is evident that the shape and the attributes of the government must partake of the changes to which the words and phrases of all living languages are constantly subject. What a metamorphosis would be produced in the code of law if all of its ancient phraseology were to be taken in its modern sense. To me, maybe I'm wrong, but to me what he's saying is, is that if you take it in the modern sense, if you look at a well-regulated militia, for example, and you only think about regulated as meaning it's got a lot of laws attached to it, and you don't understand the militia, maybe uh, you've gotten it in about the fifth generation of distortion of our government where you think it's some uh, uh, wild yahoos running around in camo in the, uh, in the woods, if that's what you think the militia is, and if you think regulated means that it's got a lot of laws to keep them under control, then you're not going to understand the Second Amendment or the purpose of it or the concern that our founding fathers had about a standing army. It's very important that we understand that just because the founders didn't have phones, doesn't mean that the Fourth Amendment doesn't apply. That is our personal effect. That is our person. Those words are very clear. Their concepts are very clear. You can understand what the original intent was. It isn't rocket science. They just use this idea of a living constitution, of a living document, to obfuscate that, to use the fact that words have changed over generations to make them mean something completely different. They understand that very well. That's why they change words like liberal. It means something very different than it did even 100 years ago. Well, stay with us. When we come back, we're going to look at some of the results of the out-of-control war on drugs. You won't believe what happened in Georgia. We're going to talk about refugees who had to go to Colorado to take care of their relative. Stay with us. We'll be right back. <laughs> I 
chemical spill contaminating the water supply in nine West Virginia counties. What are the health effects of having these drugs in our drinking water? It's forced medical treatment without the consent of residents. My friends, water filtration is one of the most basic actions you can take to protect you and your family from the harmful toxins and heavy metals in your tap water. On average, the county says it sprays with the glyphosate at least once a week. Few filters cut out the glyphosate that is found in water supplies worldwide. Remove pesticides, herbicides, chloramines, hydrofluorosilicic acid, sodium hexafluorosilicate. Fluoride it is in tea, it's in coffee, it's in water, it's in bread, it's in toothpaste. It is our responsibility to protect our families. The establishment's not going to do it. It's time to take action. It's time to filter our water. Go to InfoWarsStore.com today and for a limited time, use the promo code WATER20 and get 20% off all ProPure products. Again, that's InfoWarsStore.com or give our crew a call at 888-253-3139. The knowledge of the ancients, tried and true, trusted herbs and extracts fused with the latest nutraceutical science. Introducing the all-new Ancient Defense Herbal Immunity Blend, crafted with over 14 key ancient herbs and extracts to supercharge and prepare your body for what experts admit is the most dangerous season of the year. We have rejected hundreds of other formulations in our quest to bring you what is simply the most powerful and comprehensive proprietary formula that we have ever created in the realm of herbal immunity. For the last two years, our team has been working with top doctors, nutritionists, and chemists to develop the ultimate nutraceutical formulation. Experience the benefits of combining over 14 ancient herbs and extracts with exciting new advances in nutraceutical science. For a limited time, get 25% off on this introductory offer. Visit ancientdefense.com or call 888-253-3139. Ancientdefense.com. Baltimore's local rate of employment fell below the national average according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics. 20.7% of Baltimore's employment is made up by city, state, and federal government workers. The national average is 15%. This bureaucratic stronghold, just 50 miles from Washington, D.C., has been run by Democrats for decades, yet it ranks seventh as the most segregated city in the United States in a Brown University data project. The city council is completely Democratic. Mayor Stephanie Rawlings-Blake had a top leadership position in the Democratic National Committee and provides key input into Obama's Task Force on Policing, an initiative to federalize local and state police. State's attorney Marilyn Mosby, who is presiding over the six charged officers, is a Democrat. It still remains to be seen if she may have overcharged the officers, putting the case in jeopardy. Maryland's 7th Congressional District, which is overseen by Baltimore Representative Elijah Cummings, has been an incumbent since 1996. Apparently, the Democratic base in Baltimore is completely useless. If the transformation of Baltimore into a shining example of democratic hypergovernance has never occurred, and why does the country need to search its soul, or more importantly, federalize state and local police departments immediately after the events in Baltimore? Since Ferguson and the task force that we put together, uh, we have seen too many instances of what appears to be police officers uh, interacting with individuals, uh, primarily African-American, often poor, uh, in ways that raise troubling questions. And it comes up, it seems like, once a week now, or once every couple of weeks, coming out of the task force that we put together, we're now working with local communities. Uh, Department of Justice has just announced a grant program for those uh, jurisdictions that want to purchase body cameras. Uh, we are going to be issuing grants for those jurisdictions that are prepared to start trying to implement some of the new training and data collection and other things that can make a difference. Uh, and we're going to keep on working with those local jurisdictions uh, so that they can begin to make the changes uh, that are necessary. President Obama has unleashed his Cloward Piven-style rhetoric via his advisor and race relations bulldog, 
Al Sharpton, a former coke-dealing FBI informant who rose to prominence on the back of the Tawana Brawley race-baiting theater of lies, a man who has mysteriously suffered two suspicious fires exonerating his financial records from persecution, and is currently under fire for taking major donations for his nonprofit from labor unions that aired their hyperbole on his cable show. Al Sharpton, a man that was seen as a pariah to the Eric Garner and Walter Scott families. Does the family have any messages for anybody who might want to come into the community and incite violence or rallies or anything like that? Yes, the, the message is, what's the point? Seeing that happen in other places, that does nothing whatsoever to help the situation. It only makes it worse. This is embraced by the Obama administration. Uh, he has had Al Sharpton to the White House 80, 85 times. Uh, often when he's talking about police issues, he has Al Sharpton sitting next to him. You put Al Sharpton next to you, you just told everyone, I'm against the police. Right, we're going to do this march from here to uh, Washington. We need the Justice Department to step in and take over police in this country. In the 20th century, they had to fight states' rights and to get the right to vote. We're going to have to fight states' rights in terms of closing down police cases. The only group to do that is the federal government itself openly run by five foreign mega banks that own the private Federal Reserve. But now Al Sharpton says it's going to be the police. And that means your local counties and your cities. That means your sheriffs that the feds have been for 50 years trying to fund initiatives at the state level to have your police departments take over your sheriff's departments. That is backwards. The counties are chartered by the state. The sheriffs are elected. If the municipal government, the lowest level of government, wishes to vote for the citizens to raise taxes to create a police force under municipal law, they are allowed to. Clearly advocating the rollout of the 1961 U.S. Department of State 7277 plan that would have the police forces disarmed, martial law on the streets, and the graduation of a United Nations international police force to protect the corporocratic government as it exponentially grows into a new world order. We are trying to act as though these are problems that you can handle in isolation. There must be a national response to a national issue. And we can't keep running like hamsters. I worry about you, brother, because you could be easily manipulated by those in the White House who do have the interests of Wall Street oligarchs, who do have the interests of corporate plutocrats, and you oppose, but you end up being the public face. John Bound for Infowars.com. Now, I find it amazing that at the same time we have legislation all over this country being introduced to take away our informed consent to force us to take pharmaceutical injections, we also have safe and effective medication that is prohibited, strongly prohibited. And of course, I'm talking about medical marijuana. A shout out to Republican Governor Nathan Deal of Georgia, who this week, flanked by dozens of families, with children suffering from rare and intractable medical conditions, stood on the steps of the state capitol and signed the state's first medical marijuana bill into law. Now, the headline from Vice.com, the heartbreaking plight of Colorado's marijuana refugees. That's what I want to talk about. Understand that these are people who had medical conditions that they could get absolutely no relief for their children. They became medical refugees going to Colorado so they could get effective medication. They had to flee their homes. And these families that were standing there, he said, this has certainly touched my heart. The teary-eyed governor told reporters and others assembled for the signing, I am pleased today that we are going to make a difference. And he turned to the families that were standing on the staircases that had had to run away to another state so they could get medical treatment for their children. And he said, you can come home now. People don't realize how this affects individual families. We've had David Simpson, the legislator here in Texas, who has bravely introduced Another Republican uh, fighting his own party to introduce medical marijuana legislation because he has compassion. It breaks my heart to see that the people who are fighting this the most, in most cases, are Christians with a misplaced trust in the government's use of force to change lives. 
Listen to this particular situation, because many times we have to listen to individual stories to really put this in perspective. Now, they're talking to these marijuana refugees. One of them is uh, Jania Cox, her five-year-old daughter, uh, is the one who actually they named the bill after. They called it Haley's Hope. It legalizes certain low THC cannabis strains and oils for serious medical conditions. Now, Haley suffers from a rare epileptic condition that without treatment racks her body with hundreds of seizures a day. A little over a year ago, Haley's medical condition had deteriorated so drastically that her breathing stopped several times a day. She was at death's door. And in search of alternative treatment for her daughter, Cox moved from Georgia to Colorado, where another Georgia native, Jason Cran Cranford, had moved in 2009 to develop a low THC strain of marijuana for pediatric use. Now he says, it's hard to put your child on marijuana, quote unquote, but to see how it works, there is no way you can write it off. She went from having 200 seizures a day to about 10 to 15 on a bad day. And she's had 28 seizure-free days since they moved to Colorado. He says now she's talking more. She's making eye contact. I think the best thing is she smiles at us now. Before, she was in almost a comatose state. She was awake, but just out of it. Why? Are we holding this back from people? Why are we putting people in jail for this? This is absolute insanity. No, it's not insanity. It makes perfectly good sense. If you understand that our country is run by ruthless multinational corporations that'll do anything to anyone for a buck, and that's what this is all about, throwing people in jail because they can make money out of the prison system as well. And it's law enforcement it's uh, the government, they are all partners in this crime, in this sin, and it makes, it grieves me to see that there are so many well-intentioned, I think, but uh, just blind Christians who are jumping on this prohibition bandwagon after 40 years. Now, when David Simpson introduced this bill, he talked about some families who are suffering from seizures. Some of them were suffering from things that had happened to them because of the vaccines, but we are going to be mandated to take vaccines and prohibited from getting medical marijuana. Now, if you wanna really know what's happening with this drug war, look at the other side of it. When you use a gun and a hammer to try to solve every problem, what do you get? You get swatted with that hammer. In South Florida, this is an article from Infowars.com today, in South Florida, SWAT raids are netting minimal drugs and are often turning deadly. When they militarize themselves to that point, they say it is total overkill, and it is. Now, I wanna read you this particular instance here. This is somebody that was SWAT teamed with a very small amount of drugs on it. And they break this down in the Miami uh, Newtimes.com breaks this down. They say the SWAT team snakes behind a one-story pink and yellow house an hour before dawn breaks over a silent working class block in Hallandale Beach. As the heavily armed cops in black military gear pour into the small backyard, tank a 15-year-old pit bull, a 15-year-old dog, Rises from the concrete ground, straining at his metal chain. One cop aims and shoots the dog, killing it. Another officer smashes open the back door, hurls in a flash grenade. Officer Michael McKenzie, a burly cop covered in bulletproof gear, armed with an automatic shotgun, bursts into the narrow kitchen. He is suddenly face to face with the man that he's come looking for. Howard Bow Jr., a bearded 34-year-old with a chubby face and long dreads, wearing only a t-shirt and boxers. McKenzie screams at Bo to get down. Seconds later, he shoots him with the automatic shotgun twice in the stomach. In the next apartment, Howard's sister hears her brother scream, why'd you shoot me, he yells. His son, 16-year-old son, freezes in bed on the other side of the house. Suddenly, the door's kicked open. Three SWAT gear-clad officers storm into his room. Don't move, one cop shouts, grabbing hold of the teenager, pulling him out of the bed. What's going on, the teenager asks. 20 minutes later, from the back of a police van, the teenager watches his father, who's still conscious, and with a dazed look in his eye, rolled out of the house on a stretcher, he asks, why did y'all shoot me? This time, very weakly. Within hours, Bo would fall into a coma. Ten days later, he would be dead. The police admitted that Bo was unarmed when he was shot. They said he had no weapons in the house. Later, they found 16 grams of cocaine. More than a personal stash, but hardly a drug trafficker's hoard. See, we have tyranny, we have martial law, we have it now. You have to understand that's what this is. This isn't a conspiracy theory. We've been telling you where this would lead. 
People can't believe, and people would not have believed 20 years ago that this type of thing would be happening on such a regular basis, but it is. That's why you need to pay attention to what's going on with our military. Don't salute the uniform, salute the people who obey their oath to the Constitution. And it is civilians who need to understand, who need to direct the mission of the military. It is the people who need to direct the civilian government. Understand that this is a coalition of government, big pharma, the law enforcement people, the prison people, the military industrial complex. This is for their benefit. They are not doing any of this for your benefit. They're not keeping you off of drugs. Drugs are bigger than they've ever been after 40 years. But so is their business, whether it's the prison business, the law enforcement business, you name it. And of course, they're also supplying the drugs. Now let's take a look at Chicago. Chicago is going to be paying out five and a half million dollars in compensation to victims who are tortured by the city's police. People said that was a conspiracy theory. It didn't really happen. This is the Independent reporting this. This is uh, five and a half million dollars, mainly focused around one individual, but there were others as well. This is what Rahm Emanuel says. He says, we are strong enough to say that we were wrong. Chicago will finally confront its past and come to terms with it. Will they? Will they really? See, back in 2007, they already paid out $19.8 million to people that were tortured by a uh, com police commander, uh, John Burge. He was sent to prison for four and a half years because of perjury, because he lied about the torturing. Not because he tortured, but because he lied about the torturing and was caught in doing that. And it was actually a hung jury when they came up for the police brutality issues. But uh, the prosecutor decided not to prosecute again. See, if they have a hung jury, they can take you up to three times. And they do that for small medical marijuana people. I've seen this happen many times. But not for the cop, which makes you wonder if the per prosecution was really very energetic in the first place. So they've already paid out uh, nearly $20 million in 2007. Now they're paying out another $5.5 million because there were people that spent years of their life in jail for crimes that they did not commit because they were tortured by the Chicago police and they made a false confession. Now, one of the things that we're going to see as this tyranny gets worse is taking away our cash. And there was an article on Infowars.com today, Denmark moves towards a cashless society. They may become the first cashless society in the world. They say the Danish government has said that as of next year, businesses like clothing retailers, restaurants, gas stations should no longer be legally bound to accept cash payments. And here's the justification that they offer for this. They say, well, uh, we're going to reduce costs and increase profit uh, productivity for Danish businesses. <laughs> really? <laughs> no, they're going to increase profits for the banks because the banks get a cut of every credit card transaction. You understand that. That doesn't happen with cash. There isn't any cost associated with cash. The banks don't make any money off of cash unless they charge you a fee, a tax to deposit that cash. There's a little bit of that uh, that goes on, but they charge way more in credit card uh, transaction charges. So this is something that is going to benefit the banks. It's not going to benefit the small retailers. That is a total lie. It's a total spend. And then they say, of course, there are fears that moving to a totally cashless society would increase the risk of fraud. Yeah, probably will. But they say that, uh, and they point out, that cases of credit card fraud have doubled in the last decade in Denmark. But don't worry, because Donks Bank has taken steps to fight fraud. What are they going to do? They're going to link individuals' mobile pay accounts to their national insurance numbers. There you go. That's what's really behind it. That's the cut for the government. Say the banks get their credit card fees paid much, much higher than they ever would with cash. And then the bank can track you like an animal. And we're going to talk about that when we come back with Rob Dew. That is the basis of the mastering the human domain. That's the logo for Jade Helm. And we're going to break that down for you when we come back. But first, we're going to have a special report from Rob Jacobson about a new term that's trending used by the Department of Justice and by the FBI to create a racist environment without blaming the cops for being racist. It's called unconscious bias. And it allows them to also use psychological tools to get into the heads of the police force and manipulate them. So stay with us. We're going to have that report right after the break.
My name is Alex Jones. Most of you know me from my syndicated radio program and my documentary films, as well as InfoWars Nightly News. When I got on air 20 years ago, I had discovered the globalist program, their plan to take over the world, and my focus went from running six miles every other day, swimming two, three miles a couple times a week, and lifting weights to focusing on fighting the globalist. I've gone from 279 pounds all the way down to 235 pounds and the weight's going off even faster. Super Male Vitality, Survival Shield X2 Nascent Iodine, and Oxy Powder. Those three products of the entire family of InfoWarsLife.com products are the most important from my own personal experience. And it wasn't just that my weight loss accelerated, my muscle mass increased, my stamina, my energy levels exploded. Now is the time to take action. Start your journey today with the Alex Challenge Pack. It's the trifecta of change. Secure yours today and get free shipping for a limited time at InfoWarsLife.com or 888-253-3139. For all of recorded history, civilizations around the world praised the health benefits of silver. At InfoWars Life, our mission is to bring you the highest quality, purest, cleanest, effective colloidal silver on the market today for the lowest price available. When it comes to you and your family's health, InfoWarsLife.com is very excited to announce our biggest run yet of silver bullet colloidal silver exclusively available at InfoWarsLife.com. Now, InfoWarsLife.com has taken colloidal silver to the next level using a cutting-edge technique that is free of toxic artificial additives. Now more than ever, it's important to stock up on high-quality silver bullet from InfoWarsLife.com and to help others during Christmas by teaching them about the powerful benefits of silver. Secure your silver bullet today at InfoWarsLife.com or by calling toll-free 888-253-3139. What's wrong? You don't like a small group of psychopaths ruining your country? Well, become president of the United States and change it from the... Never mind. Three shots were fired at President Kennedy's motorcade in downtown Dallas. President Kennedy has been seriously wounded by the shooting. Much research points to the widespread existence of unconscious bias. But then there are the unconscious biases. Unconscious bias. Implicit racial bias. There's a new trend, a new term, unconscious bias. Or is it sometimes called implicit bias? That surprise and the behaviors associated with it are the product of something called unconscious bias. Everyone from government workers to private employees are all being compelled to take a good look at their unconscious minds and the hidden biases that lurk beneath. Experts claim that biases prevent employees from being productive and creative, while it hinders government employees' ability to make sound decisions. If the idea of the establishment evaluating your most hidden thoughts and emotions to determine if you're politically correct enough to function, that doesn't sit well with you, you're not alone. It's easy to dismiss the importance of the subject to the unconscious mind as simply a concept used by psychiatrists to better understand their patients. But we live in a world where you can't turn your head without being bombarded by some advertiser's attempt to influence our unconscious minds and behaviors. On top of the excessive attempts to manipulate our behavior through subliminal suggestions in the media, the psychiatric profession also serves the establishment as a convenient way to sidestep our entire judicial system with tools like the Hair Psychopath Checklist Revise, a PCLR, that they can use to directly incarcerate whoever they label as institutional. Criminal profiling has been a popular establishment tool since World War II. According to historian Gary Lockman, who stated in his 2010 book, Jung the Mystic, it was Carl Jung himself who in 1942 met with the one and only Alan Dulles and began a, quote, experimental marriage between espionage and psychology, unquote involving the psychological profile of political and military leaders. Shortly after, psychoanalyst Walter C. Langer submitted to the OSS, the predecessor to the CIA, a report that probed the psychology of Adolf Hitler. Thus, the institution of psychological profiling was born, and it has grown into an uncontrollable beast. We've all heard the controversy over the TSA profiling suspected terrorists or threats and how absolutely absurd it is to believe that the TSA can actually be trained to detect a person's inner agenda just by glancing at him. 
in a busy airport terminal for about five seconds. Which brings us to the latest trend in psychological tyranny, the unconscious bias examination. The term was virtually unknown on the web just a few months ago. Now there are literally hundreds of articles on the subject. The articles are mostly pressuring large corporations to begin subjecting their employees to this degrading, unproven, intrusive requirement. And of course, the government is already forcing its own workers to evaluate their own unconscious minds. On March 19th, 2015, the Washington Times published an article entitled, Federal Workers Ordered to Probe Their Unconscious Bias. They say a top U.S. Forest Service executive told his employees to probe their own unconscious bias on everything from race and sexuality to the disabled and fat people, asking them to use an unproven assessment tool to explore their feelings. The online test, which the forest management director urged other agency directors to use as well, specifically warns of problems when it's taken outside of the safeguards of a research institution. Users are also told to be careful about how far to go in interpreting the results. In an AP article on March 9th of this year, titled Police Agencies Line Up to Learn About Unconscious Bias, we find that police from all over the country are now being flown to LA to a place called the Museum of Tolerance. There they can learn how to evaluate and control their unconscious bias before making any potentially biased, therefore bad or perhaps fatal decisions. The head of the Justice Department program that offers this training to police departments says without even a hint of irony in talking about the unconscious bias of the police, this is one tool that police leaders are using to help really ensure their agencies engage in conscious policing. According to the head of the Justice Department's Community-Oriented Policing Services Program, the one offering the training, nobody can argue that conscious policing is a good thing, and in the midst of a tense situation, a conscious clear head is a requirement. But that's not what they're talking about. Some researchers caution that there's not enough evidence to show that implicit bias training is effective. As others have pointed out, this could potentially endanger officers by making them slower to recognize threats for fear of being called biased, or it could endanger the public by making them shoot even quicker. And they point out the training's benefits could quickly disappear when an officer gets back into the real world, or it could even increase racial bias in the long term. FBI Director James Comey said recently that rifts between police and communities can't be fully bridged until we acknowledge unconscious bias. Much research points to the widespread existence of unconscious bias. If we can't help our latent biases, we can help our behavior in response to those instinctive reactions. What about holding police accountable for their actions? Wouldn't that be a better start than an abstract examination into a police officer's mind that might impair his reaction time, putting him in grave danger? There's also a huge push for the private sector to utilize this technique for increased creativity and productivity, and not surprisingly, to root out any potential gender issues that are floating around just below the surface. Administering an exam based on unproven techniques that can affect a person's employment status sounds like a recipe for disaster. Let's not forget about the other possible consequences of introducing a compulsory system and probing a person's unconscious mind in an inappropriate setting. In this case, the workplace. Forcing people to examine their minds in this way when they're not prepared in this kind of a setting can involuntarily surface repressed emotions, memories, trauma. Without the aid of a trained professional to help deal correctly with these lost feelings, a person can experience what is known as re-traumatization and cause a person to go into deep depression, nervous breakdown, or even suicide. And finally, this kind of testing at work opens the possibilities for singling people out. If the police training facility called the Museum of Tolerance doesn't raise the Orwellian eyebrow, just think about the fact that the unthought is still a thought crime. Someone can be labeled, stigmatized, have their life ruined, all based on a test that, without proof, alleges to detect hidden thoughts, feelings, and motivations. Just a few months back, then Attorney General Eric Holder used unconscious bias to describe racial bias present in the Ferguson police force. Our review of the evidence found no, no alternative explanation for the disproportionate impact on African American residents other than implicit and explicit racial bias. 
It's clear that the establishment has been toying with this new tool for a little while, and they're rolling it out now. Considering how abusive the government is with other methods provided to them by the psychiatric profession, imagine how much more abusive it will get when everywhere you go, you will not only be judged for your actions and thoughts, but also judged for thoughts that others claim you have the potential for having. It would be a mistake not to observe how the media is bombarding us with headlines associating the term unconscious bias, mostly with gender bias, just as Hillary Clinton begins her campaign using gender bias as her campaign crutch. Remember, Hillary is proposing government fun camps for adults to go to and be re-educated into a functional member of society, the type without any unauthorized biases. I have decided we really need camps for adults. The unconscious bias exam might just be the perfect tool for singling out anyone they want and dragging them away into a government camp. So even though we could incarcerate the wrong person, we could destroy due process, we could have an all-out Orwellian tyranny, many experts say there could be something positive in this for society. Well, I've got an idea of what we could do that would be positive. How about we use it to screen potential leaders to see if they're psychologically sound? After all, we don't want our president to be a psychopath. We could even call it the Dr. Strangelove test. For InfoWars Nightly News, I'm David Knight. chemical spill contaminating the water supply in nine West Virginia counties. What are the health effects of having these drugs in our drinking water? It's forced medical treatment without the consent of residents. My friends, water filtration is one of the most basic actions you can take to protect you and your family from the harmful toxins and heavy metals in your tap water. On average, the county says it sprays with the glyphosate at least once a week. Few filters cut out the glyphosate that is found in water supplies worldwide. Remove pesticides, herbicides, chloramines, hydrofluorosilicate, acid, sodium hexafluorosilicate. Fluoride it is in tea, it's in coffee, it's in water, it's in bread, it's in toothpaste. It is our responsibility to protect our families. The establishment's not going to do it. It's time to take action. It's time to filter our water. Go to InfoWarsStore.com today and for a limited time, use the promo code WATER20 and get 20% off all ProPure products. Again, that's InfoWarsStore.com or give our crew a call at 888-253-3139. The knowledge of the ancients, tried and true, trusted herbs and extracts fused with the latest nutraceutical science. Introducing the all-new Ancient Defense Herbal Immunity Blend, crafted with over 14 key ancient herbs and extracts to supercharge and prepare your body for what experts admit is the most dangerous season of the year. We have rejected hundreds of other formulations in our quest to bring you what is simply the most powerful and comprehensive proprietary formula that we have ever created in the realm of herbal immunity. For the last two years, our team has been working with top doctors, nutritionists, and chemists to develop the ultimate nutraceutical formulation. Experience the benefits of combining over 14 ancient herbs and extracts with exciting new advances in nutraceutical science. For a limited time, get 25% off on this introductory offer. Visit ancientdefense.com or call 888-253-3139. Ancientdefense.com. Now joining me in this segment is Rob Dew and we have I think some very important insights about Jade Helm about what the logo when it says mastering the human domain what that really means. Of course we know that when they talk about unconventional warfare, they're not just talking, Rob, about uh, something, warfare that is a little bit unconventional. That's the way the ABC reporter reported it when she talked to me. She had no idea that unconventional warfare was a term of art that the military uses. Well, human domain and mastering the human domain is an actual term of art that the uh, DOD uses as well. And before I do that, I want to report that, of course, last week, the uh, Victoria Goliad counties, the Victoria County Sheriff said that Jade Helm would not be taking place in their jurisdiction. And then today we see West Virginia Senator Joe Manchin saying, we want it in West Virginia. And he was talking to Mika Brzezinski. Of course, this is the uh, daughter of Zbigniew Brzezinski, the guy surprise. that created the trilateral commission. Yeah. And he says, I don't know what's going on in Texas. I don't know the paranoia that goes on in Texas, but the people in West Virginia, welcome, welcome the special forces exercises. Please come to West Virginia. We'll open you, welcome you with open arms. We're not afraid of you. And then to double down on this article, 
We've got uh, Rick Perry, who joins with um, uh, David Dewhurst, former lieutenant governor, former governor of Texas. Rick Perry says, it's okay to question your government. I do it on a regular basis, but the military is something else, said Perry. He said, our military is quite trustworthy. The civilian leadership, you can always question that, but not the men and women in uniform. In other words, making it about the men and women in uniform, this is not a question about what the soldiers are doing. This is a question about the mission that they're doing and what this human domain means. And Rob has been going through uh, a presentation from back in uh, 2010, I think 2010. it was. 2010, yeah. And before we get to that, though, I just want to go back to that C-SPAN special that was, yeah. we played a little bit of that last night where we had people questioning the Army, and the Army kept providing non-answers yes. or evading the answer <laughs> yeah. and just not being forthright with the people. And, and I think it was the Colonel uh, John Potosik. He needs to come clean with the American people right now and just say, look, we're training for domestic disturbances. This is a plan that's been longstanding. We are going to come in. If there's any type of crisis and it gets really big, we're coming in and we're going to take charge. And they need to, so let's have that discussion. Yes, Can we have yes. that discussion? How far they're going to go? Are they going to do gun confiscations? Because I always say that's never part of the problem. Yet we see these other exercises where National Guard's training to go after sovereign citizens. And the list is endless. I mean, and that's I got the function. That's the small the, section. That's the of baseline here. thing. Is this yeah. for America or is this for somewhere else? And right. as you point out, he said, well, this is for the entire world. And that's what everybody world. was concerned yeah. about with the NDAA. They said right. that the, use, the authorization for the use of military force, when combined with uh, that authorization for the military to uh, detain people without uh, trial indefinitely. That was a very dangerous thing. That's something that we've been seeing. Of course, there's a legal infrastructure that's been set up. Mm -hmm. There's a technological infrastructure that's been set up. And this is boots on the ground for those two that we this should be very concerned about it. Exactly. And we can see when we look at this geoint that this is not just the military. This is tightly integrated with the NSA and with Homeland Security. This is tightly integrated with law enforcement. And of course, they do train law enforcement at AP Hill along with the military. They it's do. getting impossible to, to, to move these two apart. They are merging together, the military and the police, as they look more and more like each other. And I'm, I found this article just doing some research, and this is the role of federal military forces in domestic law enforcement. And this is by a retired Colonel John Birkenhoff, and it was uh, reprinted from the Joint Center of Operational Analysis Journal. And he basically talks about how Posse commentatus is outdated. We need to go in. We need to change that and have military on the grounds during domestic disturbances. Yes, and he even yeah. says it like third well, or fourth page in here. I mean, it's a long article. And one of the things I think that's so inflammatory, and of course, Louis Gohmert talked about this, was the fact that they would uh, put political areas like Texas and Utah, they're politically conservative. They paint them red and label them as hostile. Yeah. That is the essence, Rob. And we need to make clear that people understand this. That is the essence of mastering the human domain. It is geoint, and what they are doing is they're taking a human geology, they call it, is a layer that they put over the physical geology. And what they want to do is that by mastering it, what they mean is that they are not only looking at different nation states, they're not just looking at different regions, they're not looking at different groups, they're looking all the way down to the level of the individual. Right. So that's where the dragnet surveillance of the NSA comes into play. They're feeding all of that in. Think about it just as they use um, gerrymandering and politics to pick the voters. Now they are using this and mining this data. And one of the things they said, uh, Rob, was that when they're talking about this from uh, USGIF, which is a, kind of a trade organization foundation that puts all this together that got started. This is something that's about five years old, really, right. going back to some uh, uh, military uh, uh, papers. But what they were saying was that this is different from a puzzle type of environment where they used to work. Think of that as something has happened and you call in Sherlock Holmes to solve the puzzle, to solve the crime. No, this is more of a mystery. And they said in a mystery, you don't know that anything has even happened. And so you're looking at all of this data, you're trying to get a baseline and then look to see if something sticks out of the ordinary. And if it does, is it hostile or is it permissive? And then you can take action. Which right? is exactly what they're doing with Jade Helm. They're exactly. Seeing which local officials will work with them. Yes. Like this whole, we could be in the PSYOP right now and yes. we don't even know it. I think we are. And we uh, see this as, totally as, as they're looking at it. Yeah. Well, and let's go to this this conference. Uh, it was called Master of Human Domain. It was 2010 GEOINT TV conference. And the first guy we're going to hear from is Lieutenant Colonel Al D. Leonardo. And he run he ran a fusion cell for U.S. Special Operations Command. A fusion cell. Yeah. yeah. We've seen that and, before. And in the first clip, he's going to talk about how they gather data. And they use traditional, non-traditional sources. I mean, and what are we seeing now? And this is 2010. So this is before, like, DARPA was coming out with, mm -hmm. with we need to create, we need to predict the future. We need to look at all the social media networks to predict an unrest, civil unrest, 
predict people's uh, feelings on troops on the street. So you put out a, a video like we do about troops on the street, who thumbs up, who thumbs down, who writes comments, what are those comments? Those are all the things that are being integrated into this sort of system where, and they, they talk about it in more of a, you know, a worldly term, which is what the, the colonel was uh, on, on the C-SPAN thing saying, well, this is for all over the world. We're using this for all, well, of course, they're going to say using it for all over the world because they probably are using it for all over Not the world. Not a lot of social media they, going on in Afghanistan. Well, exactly. <laughs> but they are using it against us, definitely. Yes, that yes. is, you, you can 100% guarantee that. So let's go to that first clip. And I just want to warn you people <laughs> before we go to this extremely dry, extremely boring. They're using big words, so you might have to get out your dictionary. But if you just listen to what they're saying, and then I threw up some articles and some slides from Jade Helm to see how it relates. And this is another. why people don't pay any attention to this. This, this right. is why there's so much wild speculation about what do they mean by mastering the human domain. They'll put these videos up. They will get over five years, 70 views. Yeah. Okay. So nobody is paying attention to this. They're hiding these needles in massive haystacks of very boring presentations. Very boring jargon. Large, I mean, it's large just, words, ugh. but it's there. And we're going to break that down for you. Let's take a look at one of these clips. So I really had the privilege of uh, running a more of a multi-ant innovation cell. Uh, the, the cell's objectives were to use as much non-traditional data uh, in, from an Intel standpoint, uh, that means a lot of open source data, to go out and um, do sense making of data so that not only your analysts, but your machine learning, your, your algorithms you could build would, in, would ultimately get to a, a predictive analysis cell. It's very, very hard to do, especially if you don't have all the data. Uh, one, one thing I'd stress uh, as you, you glance at the slide, as I kind of talk off the slide, is that you know, basically old data is good data, new data is good data, and all data is good. He wants um, it all. Everything. In the context of how I view human terrain, somewhat controversial uh, in, some, in some aspects, is, is it's, it's, it's sociocultural information, and it becomes, when used in, in intelligence purposes or for sense making for operations, when you bring it to, to the geoint, and I don't, I don't mean to be coy in saying that, when you bring geoint to it, geographical uh, intelligence, the, I, I think it becomes human terrain. Pri prior to that, human that terrain. point, yeah. it becomes, it can be valuable information, but until you can make sense of it, uh, in a geospatial manner, it, it really is just information that's difficult to use in, in the larger context. You have to reach out and have your people using um, traditional, non-traditional data sets as you see there further to the right. And ultimately, as you bring in Esri products in GeoInt, you, you get outputs uh, as, as uh, you know, unclassified examples there of different layers that you would, you would make. The point is, is it's data, people, and technology in, in, in a multi-int uh, fusion cell. There's people in the community uh, that want to focus uh, human terrain really on what's going on on the ground completely unto itself. And uh, there's value, there's some value in that, but it's I would argue that it's, it's, it's yeah. that open source combined with the classified information, combined with the now, the old and the now, that, that begins to give you the layers you can make to, to make sense of what's really going on. You can see that at the bottom of that uh, video. It says, Mastering yeah. the Human Domain. That was 2010. And of course, if we go to uh, USGAF, they talk about a couple of things. Activity-based intelligence, ABI, is defined as intelligence where the analysis and subsequent collection is focused on activities and transactions from an entity, a population, or an area of interest, like you see the uh, hostile areas. Then they go on, the very next sentence says, the human domain or the human dimension is a vital and integral part of that. And it's defined as activities, transactions that are physical or virtual. That's why they're putting all of these uh, uh, license plate scanners as well as the virtual uh, surveillance that they have of, of cultural, social structure, relationships. They want to look at your motivation, your intent, your vulnerabilities, right. your capabilities of humans, single or groups, all across their domain of operation. Okay, So what they're doing is they're doing this dragnet surveillance that the government has put in, the surveillance state, the NSA, down to the police departments, Homeland Security is involved in this as well, mapping that onto geography. And they say, of course, this is going to be across the air, maritime, ground, and cyber. So there's your joint exercise. Total informational yes. awareness. And clip two, which we're about to go to, shows how they integrate this stuff. And then they use a color coding system, which coincides incidentally, coincidentally, exactly to the color coding system used in the Jade Helm 15 map. They have green areas 
which are what they say are totally safe, which is where they're operating out of. Mm -hmm. And then they have blue areas and red areas. The only oh, one they didn't cool. mention was brown, which is what they're saying New Mexico is. They're not mm -hmm. sure New Mexico is either friendly or unfriendly. They're not sure. But they use the same exact color coding system. So mm -hmm. let's go to that same lieutenant colonel talking about how they take all this information and create data sets. And then they basically say who's friendly, who's not friendly. So we start out with a, a layered group level analysis. This is much like traditional all source analysis, uh, intelligence preparation of the battlefield type of things, OPE these days. What we do is, but we focus it on groups. We focus, focus it on ethnicities, uh, party? religious groups. Oh, and Christians. We, we start to map out in color code the different locations. And, and we might apply some basic routing uh, and, and of transportation nodes and routes in that, and that will become a base layer. The, sec the second step we start doing is support level characterizations. The support level characterizations, we, we generally will make a scale, uh, and we'll say plus four to, to minus four. We'll take current ops activity in a particular area. We'll, we'll, we'll base it in, in the case of uh, you, you pick a place and try and neck it down into you know, uh, a, a plus four being bad, a location, a minus four being a good location, and we start to characterize the location in a color coding simple way, green, yellow, and red, and then we start layering that on top of the tribal aspects, and we start to see very distinct patterns of you know, what, what tribe X or what group X supports or doesn't support you know, act, uh, hostile activities in their vice, vice areas that, that uh, are say green and, and clear of uh, problems. This is a very all source centric approach. Read the bottom line. But right often, there. Uh, yeah. up until maybe the last five or ten years in, in the current fight, we we have not really done a very good job of making uh, the cultural aspects really relevant in everyday intelligence analysis. The next step you would take is to dive into each of those areas and do a deep dive and start focusing on the key leaders, tribal chiefs, and then specific locations in, in the example I'm using uh, to start to understand patterns of movement uh, in a multi focus to understand what's going on on the ground, where are the key locations, doing things like cost surface analysis to understand time distance travel within that group and understand what's normal activity for the particular ethnic group or location uh, of individuals within that, that region. And so you now know what's normal, and then you can follow the activity with various collection methods and sensors to get to uh, what is not normal and what needs to be uh, uh, adjusted over time. <laughs> adjusted. What do you think is normal <laughs> to these people? You know, exactly. total subservience, total bowing down, you know, whatever you say mm -hmm. is, is what we have to do. You want to put us in a fun camp? Um, all right, we'll go to the fun camp. There's a disaster. You know, we need to just, the authorities are here to help. They're always here to help. And, and that's what, what you've got in the color coding system. I mean, this foundation ridiculous. that that is uh, working closely with this GON it was there since the uh, foundation of it. They're talking about uh, when this first was brought up by the Undersecretary of Defense for Intelligence. He said there's three different uh, areas that they are drawing from in their experience to produce this. The military efforts in Iraq law enforcement here in America, mm. and Novato Casino Gaming, where they look at unusual behavior people at the table, sure. see if they're counting cards or something like that. But the two, military efforts in Iraq and law enforcement, they're saying, will something happen? How can we predict it and prevent it? So the military, as well as law enforcement, is going into this pre-crime mode, mm -hmm. which means that they're looking at, they're normalizing this stuff and saying, oh, something is out of the normal, let's zoom in on it and see if we have to take it out. And of course, one of the ways that they will take it out is with psychological operations, psyops, uh, just isolating the individuals or discrediting them or setting them up. The newest uh, pre-crime technology that's coming out, Miami's about to introduce it. It uses social media along with paychecks. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they analyze everything to try to predict where crime is going to occur. And so, you know, if you're, they're doing that on a local level, they've been doing it on a state level and oh, a federal absolutely. level for a absolutely. long time. Yeah. And, you know, DARPA's already said they want to predict the future and they're using social media to do it. And social media is a great way because everybody puts everything out there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there is here's, this, yeah. here's this trade association. They yeah. say law enforcement, and they're talking, I mean, this is not just military. This is law enforcement again. Law enforcement must deal with those who would violate the law, and they have to try to prevent them from doing so. Criminals are often indistinguishable from the normal population. There you go. So you're not a criminal until, like, in the words of the Stalinist regime, you know, bring me the man, I'll find the crime, right? Yeah. 
Uh, if they notice that you're doing something that they don't like, they do it. And they talk about how there's now this new trend in law enforcement called intelligence-led policing. And that's all of this pre-crime that we mm -hmm. keep seeing over and over again. But it's the massive amount of data pulling that in with boots on the ground. And that's what they mean by mastering the human domain. Right. Now, that was from 2010. I, uh, Joe Biggs actually found this. It was the AUSA, which is the Association of the United States Army panel, discusses the importance of the human domain. This was uploaded on 2013, but I don't think it was shot then. Um, it was on a YouTube channel. I think it had 73 views. Yes. Is this the one who he talks about bringing the military home? Exactly. This so, is bombshell. Right. You need to hear this. this yeah. uh, let's play that yeah, clip. clip one. It starts off with a question, and, and then it goes into the answer. It's a little, you know, once again, this is this is not uh, yeah. high-fidelity stuff. You're going to, you're, it's long-winded generals just babbling on. But 70 people have watched say, this in yeah, a couple of years. They say a lot of stuff that's really interesting. We have two clips. Let's go to the first one. We hear a lot about lessons learned. I know you have a center for lessons learned. Uh, I guess what, what I'd like to be a part of is helping us do it better in the future. And I think there's no operational environment we're going to go to ever that's going to be simple. They're all going to be complex, hybrid, asymmetrical, whatever you want to call them, they're complicated, and we're going to have other actors in that space. So how, what are you doing, and what's, what's the practical thing you can do, even starting at the schoolhouse level, to ensure that assessments of the operational environment take into account more than the terrain and enemy and weather, that the assessments take into account the most dynamic operational and vi uh, uh, var variable, which is the population, always. Not not just for stage F, but always, from the beginning. Um, I, I th that's a great question. And I'll tell you, it's the essence uh, of really what we're doing with strategic Now, manpower. this is the and bombshell the quote coming up here, right? Yeah, it's coming up. Of the human domain, and that uh, the sophisticated understanding of all those things you said, you know, tribal, history, language, culture, uh, it, 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 it's so significant. One of the programs we've put into place, you know, and just think about this, most of the U.S. Army is coming home. I mean, for various reasons, oh, it's oh, we're not yeah. forward deployed. This it's is not it. going to be easy to study that. This program we have of regionally aligned forces is an intellectual commitment by our Army that says Emergency? you're a professional soldier. You're likely to fight here. You better start that understanding of the operational environment. Wow. Whether you Day take no intel yes. at rest, whether your entire uh, base or your anal intel analytical section is focused on uh, supporting a specific problem set down range, studying that down to individual level fidelity, the opportunity, the preparation of putting leaders on the ground, putting great young leaders on the ground in that environment, growing, experiencing it, being immersed in it. But I think uh, identifying this lesson the fact that some did it well, some did not do it well, and then building those appropriate mechanisms uh, through regionally aligned forces uh, and the constructs that we're developing in terms of that, that intellectual commitment uh, to, to mastering that is, is, is absolutely uh, a Okay, so they're coming home. They're coming home. And when you look at the fact that they understand what the heck is going on to master everywhere. this human domain. Exactly. And when you look at the fact that they're staying here for this is an unusually long training exercise to be mm -hmm. two months. There's five points when they talk about this, uh, what this uh, uh, ABI is and what uh, mastering the human domain, human domain analytics. They say they want to collect and characterize local activities. They want to identify local actors and entities conducting activities. They want to identify, locate networks of actors, understand relationships between networks, develop patterns of life. So when they talk about how they want to move amongst us, you know, this is something they need to understand. You know, we're just here to observe, yeah. right? We might have law yeah. enforcement pull over our team Mm -hmm. uh, which is what the head of Jade Helms said, you know, to see how they react to it. Uh, and if you do, if you see him and you recognize him, then they're doing something wrong. The next clip, they go to another general. I guess he's a general. He's got a lot of ribbons. Um, he seems to be a general. He carries himself as one. And he talks about how we have to integrate uh, armed forces and NGOs and civilian operations, integrate them for during peacetime operations. So let's yeah. go to that clip. We have lots of people who've grown up over the last 10 years who understand working in a, with, with NGOs, with governmental organizations, with interagency partners. So what are we going to do now? Are we going to continue that? Are we going to continue to develop these relationships? Are we going to continue to understand each other, how to operate together? Uh, that's a challenge we have. I'm willing to assign military officers and NCOs to these organizations. Mm. Wow. I'm willing to do training with these organizations. Uh, the challenge is going to be, is it going to be reciprocal? 
and that's what we have to work on because that's They're why merging. I don't have to relearn yeah. this again. As you said, we had some problems. Not everybody got it, but we have a lot of people who did. And we have a lot of young officers and NCOs Maybe those who guys did this purged. at a very low level. Yeah. <laughs> and so it's incumbent on us to make sure that we don't lose this and that we capture this and we continue to do it in a peacetime environment. When we do our exercises now and at the training centers, we are including a civil military piece of it. The issue is how we continue to support that as we move forward and can we continue to get support. So, so there you can see the yeah. merging of the military and the police. That has less than 100 views on YouTube right now. Wow. I mean, nobody's looking yeah. for this information because it's not super sensational in your face. And, you know, that is one thing we do here. We do sensationalize things that need to be sensationalized. This needs to be sensationalized. Look, 81 views, probably five of those are from us today yeah. watching watching yeah. these clips. That's right. And getting, uh, and I guess, I don't know who Cameron Long is, but she uploaded this. It was in the low 70s when we first saw it. Yeah. yeah. And, and I mean, this is just, this is the way it's, it's going. The last clip, um, and this is back to that human domain conference, Master of the Human Do Domain in 2010, Doug Weinstein, Office of the Undersecretary of Defense for Intelligence. Yeah. So DOD oh, Intelligence yeah. is also working on this, you know, human geography component where they want to understand everything. They want they want to know when they go into an area, are they going to have more friendlies or more hostiles? Absolutely. And then and they will act accordingly to that. If you go to these GEOINT conventions, the keynote speaker in 2010, the keynote speaker in 2013, I don't know about 11 and 12, was none other than James Clapper, the guy mm -hmm. who lied to Ron Wyden, who held his hand down like this. And of course, um, uh, Michael Hayden says, shame on Ron Wyden. He knew as all the other staffers knew that they were doing dragnet surveillance and he made him lie on camera. No shame on him for lying. Yeah. But uh, of course, he's the keynote speaker of these along with other people from Homeland Security. We have people from the NSA. This is something that is, is fairly large. Again, uh, James Clapper and all of these uh, civilian uh, integrated. Spooks, integrated, integrated with together. the military, yeah. just as you heard that uh, the fellow say in the last clip. Right. So let's go to that clip. Uh, as Chris mentioned earlier, I'm a policy analyst in the Office of the Undersecretary of Defense for Intelligence, Sociocultural Analysis Program. The program was established Cultural less than analysis. just two years ago yeah. to provide Social. support for and oversight of defense intelligence, sociocultural analysis uh, capabilities to apply and integrate the social sciences in addressing defense intelligence requirements. This period of low intensity conflict, irregular warfare, and counterinsurgency operations has greatly increased the number of requirements up. related to sociocultural analysis. Those weren't his From slides. data collection models right. <laughs> to data collection itself, to taxonomies, to analytic methods, to processing, exploitation, and dissemination. These requirements reflect the growing needs of our combatant commands, our combat support agencies, the services, our national agencies, our coalition partners, um, and uh, academia as well. On just Tuesday, Director Clapper emphasized the importance of partnerships and in information Clapper. sharing and information integration within mm -hmm. the intelligence community and between our second and third party partners. Enable the combatant command sociocultural analysis cells, which exist at uh, five of the six geographic commands uh, in addition to SOCOM. So that's AFRICOM, CENTCOM, UCOM, PACOM, and SOUTHCOM. To mature their analytic capabilities with respect to uh, the requirements of their combatant commander and the Joint Intelligence and Operations Center that they exist within. There you go. Uh, it's everything. So they're looking at social network. Yeah. And one of the things that they say in this, they want to know who you are, what you do, and who you know. Those are the three questions that they're looking How for. How many with friends all this. do you have? Exactly. So yeah. that's why they're, they're scanning all the social networks. That's why they are uh, trying to actually uh, change your mind as well. They don't want to just uh, monitor what you're doing and just map that out and physically map it out as another layer on the map. They also want to be able to change you. This is another quote from this organization here. The importance of understanding the human domain has shifted. They say there's been a shift from a concentration on nation states to smaller organizations down to individuals. Mm -hmm. Today, an individual with a video camera and a laptop computer can have worldwide impact. That's why they're doing all the stuff that they're doing. And that's why you see this kind of training by the military, by the law enforcement agents, and why they're merging these things together. Yeah, exactly. And it's, it's definitely a spooky, brave new world, 1984 
scenario where they're going to know everything about everybody. And when they decide to launch the operation, a martial law plan, whatever, they're going to have their ducks lined up in a row. Mm -hmm. And probably by that time using autonomous robots to do most of the dirty work. Yes. They yes. won't be, it won't be soldiers because they know the soldiers are, they've woken up and they're not going to, they're not going to do it. Yes. I, I think I, I see right now, if they did it, 50% wouldn't participate. You know, just closing this, this report where these guys break down what GeoInt is, what human domain analytics is. They had this quote again from James Clapper. This is what he says. And think about this when you look at the logo, Mastering Human Domain. That's what they're talking about. And James Clapper said this while he was Undersecretary of Defense for Intelligence. And again, uh, that's who that guy, that last guy that you heard worked for. He says, it's given us many new arrows and a quiver of capabilities. These arrows will form the intellectual underpinning for how we conduct intelligence in the future. There you go. But Sabotage hey, we're just, in the middle of it. We're just crazy conspiracy theorists. Don't believe a word we say. Um, you know, we're just putting two and two together. Yeah, and they're and, putting it together too. Yeah. They've created legal infrastructure to justify this. They've created mm -hmm. the technological capability to do it. And they are also putting the boots on the ground to do it. And that's what they're doing. They're creating a baseline. Again, going back, this is this has been going back to the time of Donald Rumsfeld. They even talk about unknown unknowns. Remember when Don Rumsfeld talked about that? That's what they're talking about, getting a baseline, seeing what pops up, how they're going to react to it, whether they think it's hostile or permissive. Incidentally, one of the articles we showed on there was about a uh, military training exercise under the skies uh, of the valley. And uh, uh, Don Salazar wrote about it. And then you go to the link. The, it's not even there anymore. And this only came out in 2013. <laughs> They've totally erased. The, you had Down to, the had memory to go, hole. Yeah, I had to go uh, onto, uh, what is it? Um, the Wayback way yeah. Machine yeah. and actually go time travel to go find this uh, article that talks about these this military training that was freaking people out in Phoenix, Arizona. Wow. So they don't want you to know this stuff. They cover it up. They'll put it out there for a couple weeks to say, oh, we covered it. And then it goes away because they don't think you have a long-term memory and they don't think you can put two and two together. And that's why they come out with psyops like what we saw in C-SPAN yesterday with the colonel saying, hey, man, this, this is just for training you know, all over the world. Well, the military training that they're doing in the cities is getting worse. The scope of it is increasing. The frequency mm -hmm. is increasing. And I tell you, the creepiest one I've seen was the one that uh, happened recently in Fort Lauderdale. Yep. When they came in the middle of the night. They're marching people down the street single file with uh, military guards on putting them, putting them, in them white into bands. white vans and yep. driving them away. Come on. Yeah. Come on. And, you know, when they're talking about this, they want to talk about tribes. They use that in a lot of different senses. And of course, you could talk about tribes in terms of open borders. That's maybe one of the reasons they're trying to do this is, mm -hmm. is uh, tribal it. Uh, but they also talk about local governments. This is about mapping who is with them, who isn't, look, getting a baseline. Yeah, so you're looking, th th this is basically a creepy look into the, the psychopaths that want to control us. Yes. The, the psychopaths behind Jane Help. These are the criminal masterminds. They just talk. And, and they make and you want to watch the human drive. domain. And is the it, human domain is anything to yeah. do with people. They are trying to master you. That's the bottom line. And what are you going to do about it? You're going to take it lying down? You know, that's well, that's it for tonight's news. And if you're watching this on YouTube, please subscribe to our channel. If you're not a supporter of us financially by being a subscriber to Prison Planet TV, please do that as well. And of course, you can get the news every night as it happens. Share it with your friends. Up to 20 of them can watch simultaneously every Monday through Friday. Join us again tomorrow night at 7 Central. Used since before the days of the Roman Empire to support the body's natural systems and enhance overall health. Introducing the new InfoWarsLife.com oil of oregano formulation, a highly advanced nutraceutical form of this key herb that has been traditionally used by civilizations for thousands of years to promote health. We have now procured the most high quality and potent forms of oregano oil on the market, sourced from top leading manufacturers to ensure a concentrated level of bioactive ingredients extracted directly from the wild herb and sealed in easy to use capsules you will no longer need to endure the burning of liquid oregano on the tongue wild crafted from the mediterranean oregano species that experts agree is one of the most powerful and most challenging to acquire this winter season it's more important than ever to secure this true form of oil of oregano now available in our limited first run at infowarslife.com that's infowarslife.com or call 888-253-3139 you are watching the InfoWars Nightly News, which airs 7 p.m. Central at InfoWarsNews.com. And your support is helping us defend liberty worldwide.